Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Uh, we had Alex here a few moments ago, but somehow we lost him, but he's going to be back. In the meantime, I know he usually gives a presentation about what the schedule is and inviting everyone who is interested to fill out the little form on our site and let us know what it is you'd like to talk about. And hey, we have our schedule opening up in a couple of months, and we, you know, we always welcome new presentations on new subjects, different ways of doing things, and anything that that helps us produce better astrophotography images. So please do not be inhibited. If you have something, you developed a technique, and you have something to contribute, just click the little uh, email button on our site and fill it out and send it in. We'll get back to you. Tonight, we have Tom Spirak, who's going to talk us through some lucky imaging of the moon. Uh, Tom was here before, and he's coming back to kind of finish off the remainder of his ideas about lucky imaging of the moon. And if you haven't done lucky imaging before, it is really a cool thing. Uh, you can lucky image the sun with the right filter, the moon, and you can even do it with deep sky objects, even though it's kind of not the thing to do. But before we get to Tom, Steve Miller. Hi, Steve. Say hello. You're muted, Steve. Oh. Okay. Uh, give us, you know, your elevator pitch on what you're going to talk about next week. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name's Stephen Miller here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so for people that own or are considering one of those go-to Dobsonians offered by Orion and Skywatcher, now you may be aware that they can also be used for planetary and lunar lucky imaging, but you may be surprised that um, they make a pretty decent beginner deep sky astrophotography telescope too. And so next week I'll talk about how I've used my go-to dob for deep sky and how you could too, and why this is possible today when it really wasn't possible just a few years ago. Oh, thanks. And we all probably had one of our first scopes to be a long refractor or a dob, and probably none of us, including me, ever tried to image with him. We just knew we had to get a refractor. So Steve is going to counter that idea and show us what can be done. So, Tom, it's back to you. The floor is yours. Uh, give us your presentation. Okay, I'm working on it here. Okay, let me know when you see it. We see it. Okay, well, thank you inviting for my, inviting me again. Uh, tonight, I'll be talking about how to image the whole moon using the lucky imaging technique. And I'll uh, eventually get to talk about why I stuck the uh, the whole moon in there as opposed to just the moon in general. And before you get too far, you can hide that, that stop sharing by hitting the hide button. There okay. you go. And you can see my cursor? We can see your cursor. Okay, because I'll be using that continually. Okay, so here's a brief outline of uh, what I'll be talking about. And uh, normally I save the, uh, the whiz bang pictures to the end, but since uh, that's our goal tonight, is, uh, that's why I started it at the beginning. So our goal is to take this picture of the moon. And so I'll call this our final result. And I'll get into detail of, uh, about the image as we go along. Um, so that's what that's what everything I talk about will be how to create this image, how to capture the data and create this image. Then we'll talk about a lucky imaging technique in some detail. We'll talk about the hardware I use, the procedure to capture the image, images, the procedure to processing the image. And notice that uh, the goal here is just to make a pretty picture. We're not doing science or anything. So that's what, so that's what everything I talk about. Eventually, we're going to move from the science and engineering of taking imaging to just making a pretty picture. So there's really not a right or a wrong answer. This is just how I tend to do it. If if you don't like uh, my image, you're, you can take your own images and adjust it the way you want or your uh, people you're making the image for. So the, keep in mind the whole idea here is just to make a pretty picture. So what is lucky imaging? Uh, the paragraph there on the left, uh, lucky imaging is the process of capturing and saving many short exposures as rapidly as possible and selecting the good images to be aligned, average, averaged, enhanced, and post-processing. And the key word there is short exposures. 
uh, these exposures have to be on the order of milliseconds or a few tens of milliseconds, and that's to prevent the atmosphere from smearing the image. So the steps are uh, on the right. First, you capture the raw images and you save them on the, as AVI files. And then the post-processing is the rest of the steps. You go have a program that selects the good images, aligns them, and averages them. You then do wavelet processing and then other post-processing as necessary. And you'll see as we go along that Lucky Imaging, it's all about trade-offs. So I've made these little icons here, or I copied these little icons from someone on the internet. Uh, whenever I talk about a trade-off, I have this blue T, and then the happy face and the frowning face, depending on uh, which, tra which way the trade-off is going. And then another key image, or another key idea is, uh, it does take a lot of practice. Um, I've been doing this several years, and I notice that I'm still, I still get better results as I go along. So even though this is somewhat of a science and engineering uh, aspects, it does take practice. So now this is, um, this is not the moon. This is a, an image of Saturn, which is uh, from a video. And the whole point here is the purpose of lucky imaging is to defeat the shimmering of the atmosphere, or as we call it, bad seeing. Can, can you see this video playing? Yeah, we can. Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, anyone who's looked through a, through a telescope at the planets, you know that the planet is not perfectly still. It's shimmering. And this is because this is caused by uh, heat fluctuations in the atmosphere. And so that's the whole point of what we're trying to do here is to capture many short exposures to freeze the seeing. And then we can uh, work on the images later. And this, this effect happens with everything, not just the planets, but the moon and deep sky, et cetera. So this is a hardware page. Now, this is what I happen to use. I use a four-inch F9 Skywatcher refractor. Now, of course, there are many uh, trade-offs going both ways with any telescope, aperture, focal length, weight, complexity, expense, et cetera. This is just what I happen to use. And it, uh, it does the job for what I want. Uh, to do. Uh, you do need a stable mount with a clock drive and you we want reasonable but it doesn't necessarily have to be perfect polar alignment and that saves on setup time because I do not have a permanent observatory so I have I have to set up and take down my scope uh, every time I use it um, but the fact that I don't need perfect alignment uh, decreases the time setup and the reason uh, you don't necessarily need perfect polar alignment is because you actually would like the image to slowly drift across your chip so it's not perfectly stable. So you actually don't want perfect tracking. However, you can't have, uh, you can't be too off from the pole because field rotation will start to creep in and that will hurt us. So you want to just have decent polar alignment. You also, of course, need a camera and a specifically a fast readout camera. I happen to use the ZWO ASI 1600 monochrome without a thermoelectric cooler. Um, again, we need a fast readout camera because again, we need to take uh, exposures that are in the order of uh, milliseconds or tens of milliseconds at the slowest. I, use, I happen to use a monochrome, which is kind of ideal for the moon. It does have a large chip because I want to, as I'll show shortly, I want to take the moon in one image. So I want the entire image of the moon on the chip at once. I don't want to have to take pieces and then put them together later, which is a good uh, trade-off. But of course, the negative trade-off is that bigger chips are more expensive. And to deal with the fast readout camera, you need a computer with a solid state hard drive, which is a good quality. Because in my particular case, I believe I'm uh, the pictures I'm taking uh, are on the order of 200 meg or more per second. So you need a USB-C drive, a USB-C uh, connector, and a solid state hard drive that can uh, take these images and write them on a continual basis. Uh, so you do need a fast uh, solid state drive. And of course, the disadvantage is, is that they're more expensive. And you have to be careful that you have a good quality drive that's not limited by its buffer. I've uh, Unfortunately, I uh, had a wasted several, quite a few hours in figuring out this problem. I actually had to get, get a replacement drive for the computer I bought 
because it had some uh, buffer problems and was slowing my imaging down. You also may need some color filters. I'm using this four inch F9 refractor, which has a significant amount of chromatic aberration. So I use color filters to uh, cut that down. So again, that depends on the optical tube assembly. If you're using a Newtonian, you don't have chromatic, chromatic aberration, so perhaps you don't need a filter. One disadvantage is it removes, uh, reduces light, which increases your exposure which uh, gives the atmosphere more time to blur your images, so that's not good. It also, however, can help with poor seeing, because seeing is better at longer wavelengths. It's kind of why the sky is blue. The sky is blue because the atmosphere affects the blue more than it does the green and the red. So if you have a night of poor seeing, you can put in a red filter and actually improve your seeing. Of course, a longer wavelengths reduce the resolution of any given aperture in a telescope. It also, using filters can expand your opportunities for imaging. I use an infrared cutoff filter uh, shown here. It starts at 850 nanometers, and you can actually image the moon during the day. Uh, this helps with if your schedule, for whatever reason, doesn't permit you to image the uh, moon that night. I have a problem with some trees in the low and the west. Um, or if it's going to be cloudy at night and you have an opportunity during the day. So um, an infrared image, which, which perhaps is not quite as good as a red or a blue image, is basically better than nothing. So this is another hardware page. One, one thing you have to do is determine the effective focal length at which you're going to image. And that, and that will determine the image scale that you want or need. Now, image scale is um, an aspect of your image, and it's defined as arc seconds per millimeter, or you could say uh, degrees per inch. But it's some uh, piece of the sky divided by a physical space on your chip. So uh, uh, the units that are typically used are arc seconds per millimeter. So you have to determine what scale you want to image at. For doing the planets, and this is a, another discussion, not for this particular uh, presentation, in order to capture the maximum amount of fine detail for any telescope, you need to work at about f23 when your pixels are 3.75 microns, and that's the pixel, the size of the pixels uh, on the ZWO I'm using. The problem is, if you do that on this particular setup, then my moon will be physically larger than the chip at, on the ZWO 1600. And that means I would have to take four images, four sets of videos, and then process them and then stitch them together. So it's literally five or six times the work if you uh, use this focal length, to, which, would which would capture the maximum amount of detail that the telescope can provide. And um, in my opinion, it's just for this, my particular case, it's just not worth that effort. Um, having a bunch of high high resolution images on the computer that are only looked at on a computer screen when you really can't appreciate is really uh, just a waste of that effort. Also, in order to appreciate them, you would literally have to print them out two or three feet across, which is fine and impressive, but how many of those can you deal with? So. I just, I sacrifice some detail and I stick with the native F9 so I can uh, produce uh, or I can image the moon uh, on the chip in one piece, as we see here in this example. So now we're going to talk about actually capturing the images. I use Fire Capture, which is a free piece of software and it runs most cameras. Um, there are other pieces of software that you can use. This is just what I happen to use. Uh, you can set your region of interest, which um, if you want to use the entire uh, field of view of the chip, you select maximum here, and it will download the entire chip, uh, which is and then the ZWO is about 3,000 by 4,000. However, the moon is a, a little bit smaller than the full size of the chip, and there's no point in just downloading black sky. So you can manually crop around the moon and you only download the portion of the chip that you want. Uh, the benefit that is, 
uh, you increase your frame rate, which is shown here at 23 frames per second. Uh, and you also uh, don't fill up your hard drive with just useless black pieces of sky. You also can set the gain of the camera. That's on this slider. Now, a higher gain allows for shorter time exposures, which is good because that prevents the atmosphere from blurring the image. But, but higher gain means a noisier image, so that's bad. However, if we take a lot of images, we can average them, which beats down the noise, so that's good but we can't average too many because one aspect of lucky imaging is that the target has to be stable. If the target changes, it messes up the lucky imaging technique. So you can't just keep averaging and averaging and averaging uh, because our in the moon, we have the fact that the sun angle is changing. So we do have a limited amount of time to uh, take our images. Plus, not to mention it fills up your hard drive pretty quickly. The tip, I typically, uh, on a night of um, imaging the moon, uh, which creates that picture you saw at the beginning, that takes up about 100 gig of space, uncompressed, which that tends to build up over time. You also can set the exposure with this slider here. Um, one nice thing that I like about um, fire capture is you can set all this details about your image. You tell it. Your target is the moon. I have a red filter, and it will automatically save a log file. So you basically don't have to write down any notes. Everything is saved for you automatically. You set the number of frames you want to capture. At this particular time, it says no limit, but you can type in any amount, a number of images you want. And when you press this go button, it will start collecting and saving as fast as it can. It also shows the histogram of this image. This histogram, which we'll talk a little bit about later in more detail, is simply a uh, plot of uh, here on the left is a zero, and it counts from zero all the way up to 255, keeping in mind this is a 8-bit di digital images. So this image is simply a grid of numbers in the computer. And then the this uh, vertical axis shows how many pixels are at each of those numbers. So this little tail here shows you in the 0, 1, 2, 3 region. That's because there's a lot of black pixels. That's why we have this tail here. And over here, there are no pixels that are very, very bright because uh, I deliberately set the image uh, like that. And you tend to always want to set it so your, your final tail is about in this 3 quarters to 2 thirds region from 0 to 255. And then once you have all that set, you simply hit start, and the, this fire capture will go through, take these images as fast as it can, and it saves an AVI file uh, with the in, those number of frames that you input. And then in addition to your standard exposure, uh, you can then take additional exposures, longer exposures, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, for your high dynamic range imaging. If anyone has any questions, you just interrupt me. So well, now we're going to talk you, about... You stop for a moment. Uh, you're shooting everything at bin one, Tom? Yes. For the planets and the moon, everything is a uh, one by one bin, yes. And is that the most ideal setup for the moon and the size of your chip? Uh, and yes. you're seeing conditions? Yes. Um, um, you, for ex If you ever do, for example, uh, deep sky, when you're taking pictures that are seconds or minutes long, the atmosphere will blur out your fine details. So there's really no point in taking a, a high-resolution picture of a blurry star. So that's when you would uh, bin your chip, say, 2 by 2 or 3 by 3 uh, to increase your signal-to-noise level. But in this particular case, when you want a lot of fine detail, you keep it the bin uh, one by one. And that's fine uh, with the with the moon, even with a moderate range of gain. Um, it's my exposures are less than a millisecond. Tom, uh, did you mention what your gain and offset uh, with your ASI 1600? Well, the the. 
there is not there's not necessarily a standard gain that you work at. Um, I tend to leave it at the middle range here in 300 if it's a, a good or decent seeing. However, if the seeing is bad, you then increase the gain so you can decrease your exposures. These are uh, as you as you increase the gain, you can decrease your exposure. So if the uh, seeing is bad and you need to really freeze that seeing, you want a very fast exposure. So you would subsequently increase the gain to allow you to do that. So mm -hmm. there, there is really not a rule. Every, everything is um, subject to the conditions and kind of every night is a little bit different. Okay, so thank you. Tim, that, have... that answers your questions, right, Tim? Okay, go ahead, Eric. Um, you want to have, don't you want to have the minimum gain because gain adds noise, but not have too much exposure, which will limit your frames per second. So it's kind of a balancing act between those two. Yes, um, let's see. As I, here, as I, as I say here, higher gain allows for shorter exposures, which is good but the image is noisier, which is bad, but averaging many images beats down the noise, which is good, but you can't average too many because the target is changing and it's filling up your hard drive. So everything is a trade-off. And um, the way I happen to do it, and this is just not, this isn't a rule, this is just how I choose to do it. I tend to take uh, 4096 images in every video so I'm taking a lot of images. So I have the images to beat down the noise. And which you. which you'll see which you'll see shortly. Okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, setting it up for high dynamic range imaging. The image here on the left of the moon is is the standard uh, image where we have our standard histogram like I showed here. And again, this is just a grid of numbers in the computer from zero to 255. So the blacks are 0, 1, 2, the middle grays are 100 and 101, the bright is 200, 201, et cetera. And that's fine. The problem is we're really setting our exposure for the bright portions and we're underexposed for the dark portions. So what we do is we take several exposures uh, in, each one is increasing the exposure time. So in this middle image, we're now blowing out a little bit these white regions, but our middle regions are better. And then in this right exposure, we've really blown out our bright region, but our dark regions have good exposure. And then later on, there's a piece of software that will combine these three images and find the good parts of each to make our final image. So I, if I can, I try to use five. You need at least three, but the software I use is a maximum of five uh, different exposures to create your final uh, image. So <clears throat> what I tend to do is I call exposure number one, I call it the correct image, which is this one on the left. And then exposure number two is my longest, brightest image. <clears throat> And then for the rest of the exposures, say if I'm taking five, what I do is I take the longest exposure minus the shortest divided by the total exposure minus one, and that tells me the steps. So for example, in this case, if I take a one millisecond on the left and a three millisecond on the right, three minus one is two, two divided by uh, three minus one is two equals one, that means the difference uh, from the brightest to this middle is one millisecond. That's assuming you want a linear, uh, a linear uh, steps. You, there's no, not necessarily a rule. That's just how I happen to do it. And so at the end of this process, we have M, say in, in, in this particular case, three, but I tend to like five uh, AVI files, one AVI file for each exposure time. And I tend to use, again, 4096 frames per AVI file. So in my case, this N individual frames is 4096. And these AVI files, of course, are what, what fills up your hard drive most. So 
So now we're into processing the images, and there's four basic steps. We use AutoStacker for image selection and alignment and averaging, and that's free. We use Registrax for wavelet processing, which is also free. And then I use Photomatics Essentials for HDR processing, which does cost some money, and Photoshop Elements for general processing, and which also costs some money. Um, these are in the range of 50 to $70 each, and for the amount I use them, which is a lot, and uh, they are very, very helpful and save a lot of time, I think it's worth it. And we'll now go over each one of these steps in detail. And later on, I have my email at the bottom if anyone has any questions, because we're going to be going over a lot of details quickly here. Uh, you can just email me. So for processing the image, this we use, again, AutoStacker. You open the AV AVI file and you select the region of interest for contrast testing. So here we use the open button and then we just, as with any other file, select the AVI file. In this particular case, I'm opening my first exposure and it shows me an image of the moon here. Here it shows, this is image number one of 4096. And as I said before, I tend to take 4096 images per uh, video. And then I've selected uh, this green box to is my uh, contrast checking region. You then select this analyze button. And the program will now check the contrast in each of the 4096 images in this box. And it will create this graph. There's two, uh, two lines here. Uh, they have the same data just arranged differently. The uh, gray line, the x-axis, is uh, from 0 to 4096, and it's in image order. So this is, you can see that the uh, seeing of the atmosphere is constantly changing up and down and up and down. And this, this for example, uh, was shown in that image of Saturn. This green line is the same data, simply plotted from best on the left to worst on the right. And this is a typical, uh, this is typically what this looks like. Then you, so the next step is determine how many frames that you want to keep. We have 4096, but as this green line shows, some of them are bad, or should say not good. Some of them are moderate, and some of them are very good. So we have to decide how many do we want to keep. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to simply choose one uh, one choice in reg in Registax. You can actually, I mean, AutoStacker. You can actually choose four. So up here on these green boxes, I've chosen to to make four different uh, averages: two fifty six, five twelve, ten twenty four, and twenty forty eight. So uh, when this process is finished, I'll have four images, uh, each with a different number of averages. Input the number of frames, then just select the alignment points. So over here, in this, this is the where you're selecting how the program is going to align uh, every image of the moon onto uh, the master. And the easiest thing to do, uh, let it do be automatic, you select this 200 pixel box and then simply select place alignment point grid and it will automatically place all of these green uh, 200 by 200 pixel boxes on the moon. And th that's what it, these boxes are the points it will use to do all of the alignment of the various images. And then you sim simply select stack. Uh, Tom, can you explain why you choose 200 pixels as your alignment boxes? Uh, because uh, because it's the biggest of the choices. If there was if there was a bigger choice, I would select it. Because as it is now, there's 219 of these alignment boxes. Um, you could do it. You could select manual draw and then draw your own. Um, the problem with that is um, you. In this particular example, I'm only doing one uh, AVI file at a time. You actually can do batches of AVI files, um, and it will use the same set of alignment boxes. 
if you select manual draw and the moon is moving around a little bit on your chip, uh, those alignment boxes are going to be moving around. So I, that's why I tend to let it be, uh, I use the automatic function. So every time it starts a new AVI file, it will redraw these automatically. So, and there are a couple questions that have come up. Uh, sure. Can you eventually show an example of the IR image in the moon during the day? I don't have that prepared. Uh, I can send out an email, but I, I can I can tell you that they, it looks 99% as good as a night image. Uh, but I, perhaps I should have done, I should have uh, been prepared for that. Well, but I think I can you teased us a little bit about that, so. Uh, and did you try taking images of first quarter, second quarter, and so on to make composite images? I have not done that. And the last question is, have you tried any other alignment point sizes? I guess that was my question too. Yeah, the, the answer is I always use the 200 because it's the biggest of the choices. Uh, there are, and there are a lot of them as it is. If you if you were to make this smaller, this would go up. Uh, this is half the size, so there'd be four times as many. And it, it just, I, I don't I don't think it's necessary, and it will uh, greatly increase your processing time. What I tend to do is when I take my stack. Uh, I mean, sometimes I, for example, this this whole process, fortunately, is relatively quick so I can from the time I go out say if I want to take a last quarter moon I can get up at two in the morning go out really quick and I can be back in half an hour and then I set up this program to crunch through these five AVI files automatically overnight which is which is the advantage of letting it doing it automatically okay, so the point you. is it's the point is it's this really does not take a lot of uh, personal time there is a lot of number crunching but that's all done by the computer when uh, i'm asleep i think the bottom line in that series of questions is what is the difference in the resultant image quality between a small alignment box and a big alignment box between more alignment points and fewer alignment points what is the difference I don't think there is a difference uh, on these particular images of the moon because okay. we're not, I'm not, uh, these aren't designed to be super high or super high resolution with uh, very small detail, which is uh, part of it. Uh, it's it, which is a, um, it's an artifact of the, my choice of wanting to image only the moon, the whole moon on the chip. However, when I do Jupiter, for example, if you make the alignment boxes too small, uh, the program will create features. So you do have you do have to uh, be careful of that. Okay, does that answer your question, Isaac? And uh, then Dean came up with another question while we were questioning you. I he says that uh, one, he does one to five second. He says he does five second videos, and he uses fifty frames even though he has about 200. Should I set the frames to stack height? And I don't, should I set them higher? I, is He's corrected himself. To, should mean, should he mean, take more frames? Should he uh, choose a smaller percentage of his actual frames? Oh, we're going to get into that shortly. Thank you. Okay, Dean, hang on. Yeah, I, I realize that this is this is a there's a lot of information and this is a little complicated but in this amount of time we kind of have to go quick but again feel free to email me later okay okay so we've we've uh selected our alignment points we select uh, the stack button so the program went through and it selected the best 256 512 1024 and 248 frames aligned average and saved them as four separate tiff files so the next step is we have to select which one we want to use. So what we do is we now have four images of the moon, which are resulting of these of the different number of uh, 
averages. So uh, one trade-off is averaging more images results in uh, reduces the noise, which is good. But using more frames means that we're using more lower quality frames, which is bad. And so it's uh, imagine if you use them all, you're gonna you're that green. We're gonna be using that entire green line. In my particular case, the maximum is I use half. So we have to decide which one uh, to pick. Now these are the raw files that we displayed uh, that I'm displaying that are, that have come off of auto stacker and here we see there's the 2048 1024 512 256 so it's a little tough to see the details in this particular uh, example so what I do is I apply wavelets to each one and then I choose so this is an example of the advantages of wavelets and this is let's see uh, here on the left what I did was I took the same I took the moon I ran it through wavelengths, and the left half is the result of the wavelets, and the right half is before. And then this picture on the right is a close-up. So the left half is with wavelets, and the right half is without. So it's clear, you can easily see that there's a lot more fine detail after you use the wavelets. So I take those four images, run them through identical wavelengths, and then make my choice. So this is, uh, we, I use Registax to do the wavelets. So you select an image up here on the upper left, just like any, uh, any other program, you select your image. I select one of uh, my samples. Then you have to select, uh, or you have to set the, the, the uh, wavelet application. So you, you have to set the, um, the amount of the denoise, the amount of the sharpen, and then the slider in each of these layers. So you have layer one to six. You have a denoise for each layer. You have sharpen for each layer. And then you have a slider for each layer. So there are many, many different choices with all these uh, options. So you basically have to experiment uh, and figure out what works best for you. Now, one thing to keep in mind is layer one operates on the smallest features layer two the little bit bigger features three bigger etc where six operates on the largest features my experimentation has shown me that i only need to use the first three layers with these settings everything 0 0.2 on the denoise 0 0.2 on the sharpen and then uh, 20 10 and 10 on the sliders so once you figure this out you can save it and then just keep reapplying this. It also, uh, this does take a bit of time, number crunching. So when you're first doing this, what is best to do is to just uh, take a slice of the moon, save it, and then uh, do your uh, determination of these settings on just a small piece of the moon, because uh, just to save your number crunching time. So then now you apply this, the same wavelet application to each of these four images. And this is what we, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, an example. And so this is a, uh, I've blown up the sections of this, uh, the same piece of the moon of each of the result. And uh, this is how I make my choice. So note that the fewer frames that are averaged to produce an image results in more noise. So fewer in frames is more noise, but it's sharper. So here on the left, we have 256, then 512, 1024, 2048 on the right. And um, you tend to look at these images closer than you normally would when you're looking at an image. Uh, so basically that you can see greater detail. So what I would do is, if you look at this uh, Mare region here on the left, you see that it has more salt and pepper speckle than it does here on the right. That's because this uh, fewer images uh, has more noise. But also, perhaps, if you look at these tiny little details on the left, it might have some more sharper features than it does on the right. 
So you basically have to uh, go back and forth and pick the one that you like the best. What I find in general, uh, ex except for the noise, which is a little obvious, uh, many of the um, fine features, it, you can spend one minute or five minutes trying to decide. And if it's that, if it takes you that long, they're really all pretty close. So I think in this particular case, I just chose uh, 1024. But again, it's, it's, it's perhaps an opinion. Let's see. So all in and consuming. So then what you do is you then apply auto stacker to 1024 and those same Registack settings to the rest of the AVI files. So I experiment. If I took five AVI files, I experiment on one and then make my decisions and then apply those settings to the rest. And what you end up is with uh, five final um, images of the moon. Each one of these is an average of 1024 and using the same settings in the uh, wavelets. The only difference is the exposure. And here on the left is, I call exposure one, my quote correct exposure, where my uh, histogram, the tail of the histogram ends about here two-thirds or three-quarters of the way from left to right. So now the next step is to uh, make our high dynamic range image. Unfortunately, the this is one, uh, one little hiccup in the situation. The high dynamic range software requires that all of the input image has the same horizontal and vertical pixel size. And when you go through this process, they don't. So you just simply have to create you create a black frame. I tend to say do 2,500 by 2,500 pixels and just cut and paste uh, each image. And then I save them in, uh, as exposure one to five. It's a, it's a trivial step, but it's unfortunately required. It takes a real time. So that means you align them manually, Tom? Uh, no, you, no, you do not have to align them. You just cut and paste and Photoshop will automatically put the, put the moon in the center and then the uh, HDR software does the alignment. You do not have to align these. This is, this is simply a cut and paste step. So here, here's on the, on the right side is my, the 2,500 by 2,500 black, pic, black uh, image I made and then I simply select the moon, paste it in, and save it. And I do that for each of the five. So our next step is to make the high dynamic range image. So I use this uh, Photomatic software. Uh, you simply start it like any. You select Browse. And I've these are exposures one to five. Those are the files that I just created manually, 2,500 pixels square. So they're all the same size. And it loads them in, and you can, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to worry about they look a little strange at this point, and you just select adjust. And now here's some more sliders that you have to uh, figure out how you want to uh, set them. I tend to use the natural uh, settings, and that gives me these choices: strength, exposure, balance, local contrast, color saturation, brightness. Color saturation doesn't matter because it's a monochrome image. So then you just uh, basically practice adjusting these other four sliders to make it look uh, how you like it. I tend to like the local contrast on the more contrasty side. But again, as we stated at the beginning, uh, we're just making a pretty picture. There's really no rules. If you, if you don't like it, change it. And so it's just by experimentation. And so once you have your slider set, you select uh, Finish and Save. It asks you if you want to uh, denoise the picture, so you just select Yes. And it goes through, and it makes your uh, final high dynamic range image, and you save it. So now we have our um, 
this is a copy of the image that I started with at the beginning. So this is the final result. So the image here on the left is that first exposure that quote using the correct histogram and the one on the right is my high dynamic range but we still have a little bit of uh, cleanup work to do in photoshop so in photoshop i load my two uh my two images this exposure one and then this this uh, here is the output of the high dynamic range and uh, these labels uh, aren't in the image i just uh, put them here for clarification this exposure one and high dynamic range and i misspelled that so here are our images and we need some cleanup so first thing is uh we have to align them if you want uh north north up south up however you want to do it i tend to like north north as up um and keeping in mind that uh, the moon on the sky is constantly, it has vibration, it's tilting this way and that. It, uh, because of the orbit, sometimes we see around the left, the east side a little more, the, the west side a little more. So even if you come up with your own standard or, a st or, or someone else's standard, it's going to be constantly changing. So I, this is more, more of an aesthetic thing uh, and, and how you like to do it. So what I tend to do is I have a map here of the moon which is aligned north-south, and I just, for example, use the right side of Plato aligned uh, above, I forget what this constant, this, uh, this crater is called. I basically align the left side here with the right, the right side here with the left side here, and I call that, that's my north. If I'm doing uh, a phase where this is in the shadow, I use some other craters. Sometimes I also, if it's a crescent, it's nice to have the crescent tilted, so so I just kind of do it by eye. Again, it's all just aesthetics to the eye. So you rotate your images. So, so in my particular case, north is up. So in this case, I had to rotate the image left 158 degrees. So we, we have the craters lined up. So now we have both rotated. We, we want to fix the backgrounds. So now we have nice black. But we also have some scattered light problems, which is obvious in this uh, in this right right image here. So what you do is now I'm going to just be working on exposure one. You use the levels feature to uh, to exaggerate the contrast just to see where the scattered light is. So you drag you drag this slider to uh, high. Uh, to um, exaggerate the scattered light. So I've dragged that slider, which was at 255. It's now here at 41. And now we see that the moon has this light ring around it. So we need to fix this because it may show up later. So we use the paint bucket and the paint bu uh, buttons to uh, fix this. And sometimes you have to manually zoom way in on this and, and literally with a paintbrush, paint over that, sometimes hugging the, uh, the edge of the moon. So this is sometimes time consuming, but you do have to get rid of this uh, scattered light problem. So now I fixed it, I exaggerated it again, and we see that it's gone. Then once we fixed the scattered light, we now can adjust the levels for our, uh, our, our final view of the image. So what I tend to like to do is there's always this long tail in this histogram. So I tend to like to drag the slider uh, about this point. Again, every, every phase of the moon is a little different. And I also like to darken, uh, darken up the uh, blacks. And so this, this will be the final image that we present at the end. And again, this is just all to taste. And you also can apply an unsharp mask. I tend to, if I do it, it's, I keep it pretty mild. Tom, Tom, could you go back to that last slide? Oh, no, that's a slide. You can't, you can't uh, click preview and not preview and show us the differences. So if it were actually PowerPoint 
Or uh, actually right. Photoshop, you could just show us the difference. Right. Okay, sorry. Right. But I, um, I, can you give us an idea how that piece of software works, how it combines the images? And, other than clicking a button, is there a way that it selects certain areas of lightness or darkness? Uh, just a second. What it does is it it's it sees that there's uh, areas, for example, of oversaturation. So it doesn't use these these oversaturated images. Is is the is as I understand it that basically how it works. It's you you can do this manually in Photoshop. If I'm not a Photoshop expert, I I kind of I know what I have to know to do what I want to do, and I. I have a friend who is a Photoshop expert who I ask when I have questions. So you can do this if you just have Photoshop and you can do it manually by overlaying uh, overlaying exposures and then adjusting the transparency of each. This kind of if, if you're not an expert, it uh, it takes it takes a lot of that uh, those difficult steps away. But you can when you when you adjust the sliders, you can make it uh, you can blow this out if you want, for example. So all, all of that data is still there. You can use it how you choose. Or you can make this much darker. You can make it much brighter. And there, just like uh, sometimes with these sliders, there's so many options. Uh, you could spend hours just choosing the one you want. Eventually, you kind of just got to say good enough and go with it. Where were we? Fix that, that, that. Okay. Okay. So now this is our final image, which we'll put in our uh, that final doubled image of the moon. So now we have to fix uh, the scattered light in the high dynamic range image. And I fix that, and I this is just to check it. And again, you know, this, these images they tend to have these tails, and I I bring the slider in. To try to uh, to get the maximum amount of uh, contrast, but again, that's just a taste. And then I make um, I make a black frame. It tends to be on the order of five thousand by three thousand pixels. And then I paste these two in. Are my two final images. You always use this lineup feature because the the eye is very good at uh, detecting when things are out of alignment. So I try to I try to center things up nice. And I also notice that at least in my eye, the high dynamic range image they always look a different size left to right than the normal image. However, if you were to uh, put these uh, one on top of the other, they exactly match. Even to my eye, they they look like they're different size. And then um, I always save this uh, two, in two formats. I always save it in a TIFF format, which saves all of the information, including the levels, uh, et cetera, in case I want to edit it later. But I, then I always save it in a JPEG format uh, for when I send it out via email. <clears throat> and then the question is, um, how much of JPEG compression do you need? Here I indicate I tend to use eight. And if we look here, this is a close-up of Plato. Here on the right side, we see the t original TIFF. Here on the left side is the eight, eight, uh, JPEG with the level 8 compression. And we can see we can just start to see some JPEG artifacts. However, uh, the image is not intended to be looked at this closely. So uh, I consider this good enough. And there is a huge savings. The TIFF image is 21.7 megabytes, but the email, uh, the image that I will email is only 1.3 megabytes. And then that's our final image. So this, this, uh, the actual collection of the data takes on the order of a half an hour. And that's assuming I'm doing five, uh, five AVIs of 4096. And then I set it to crunch overnight 
and then the next day I do this final series of uh, of cleanups. And then I email this out to whoever I think is interested. And that's Alex, the there was another question you want to <laughs> ask. I guess. Well, I'll ask it. Uh, do you know if the scattered light is from Earthshine? Uh, no, I don't. Oh no, Earthshine is much, much too dim. Um, and I actually know that for a fact because I used to, uh, I used to work at the Big Bear Solar Observatory, and I built a telescope that studied the Earthshine. And you have, in order to get a decent Earthshine image, you have to sometimes expose for many seconds or even minutes. So Earthshine is is much too dim. It's um. It could just be scattered light off of haze or perhaps inside the telescope. Uh, but especially when you have those long exposures with the very bright regions. Uh, so the, the high dynamic range image tends to suffer more from the scattered light than the normal. And so there, there basically is always some level of cleanup, but it's definitely not from Earthshine. And what's your typical frames per second in your captures? 18 to 25 it depends depends on the phase of the moon because um, the smaller the phase you can crop the the chip more so you want to you want to be you want to crop the chip as much as you can uh, still have a little margin around the edges uh, also you want to be able to you actually want it to drift across the image a little bit to make sure that uh, if you do have any uh, specks of dust or anything on your chip, they get smeared out when it gets averaged. Um, but in the order of 18 to 25. Any more questions? Uh, you in the audience, you know, now's your time to ask uh, Tom uh, questions about his process and his capture. I don't see or just, anything. Or just send me an email. Yeah, his email is right in the bottom. I'm sure there are more questions that might have been answered in the presentation. I guess people send you questions. You can respond to them directly. You okay with that? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you can stop sharing if you want. Okay. Hey, I missed the first part of this. Who's uh, who's the host tonight, Eric? Uh, yes, I am. Can I say something? Of course. Um, <laughs> we don't have Rory. any higher. higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we knew what we were doing in the first place, right? Uh, Eric, or Ryan, or Rory. Rory, did you yeah. have, uh, Did you? is anything going on with the workshops? Nothing did, yet. Did you, get, did you get a chance to talk to, to the people about that before while I was out? dithering around no we uh i mean I, I haven't got any emails yet everything's set up so um you know i think uh usually what happens it takes a couple of weeks to kind of get the word out there and then emails started coming in but for anyone who's interested head over to astro imaging channel and you'll see your TAC workshops over there and there's yeah. an awesome uh image of ngc 2467 it's the school and crossbones nebula submitted by kevin moorfield um, you could download the uh, files there, edit them, and then send them uh, to the email we have listed on that same web page. And uh, we'd love to have you do a five-minute presentation of your workflow if you're if you're uh, inclined. Um, I can, and I, I think I'm you, sharing I'm now. I'm sharing now, all right? Yes. Yeah. Sharing. Okay. So there's there's here's what we're talking about. TAIC workshop. You go over uh, on the website. You hit the AIC web shot and you come down here, you got a place to get the information, all the, I think there's seven files, including the, uh, the different um, uh, narrow bands. And then when you're finished processing it, you submit it to um, Rory and he, you know, works with you and figures out how we put the show together for, uh, when are we, August? We're going to show that. August 27th, yeah. August Kevin will be here too, and he'll go over his uh, the uh, the equipment he used to get that image. So, 
Okay, cool. Yeah. And All this right. is a, a data set from his Chile setup in the high Andes. Uh, and I can tell you, I've downloaded it. It is a fantastic data set. And with all seven filters, there's a variety of images that you can make. Starless, RGB, narrow band, put RGB stars into narrow band. So I would not be satisfied if you do that, just to create one image, create a variety of image. And you'll see what Kevin's process is as well. So there's a lot of possibilities here. It's a great data set. Um, and if you want other good data sets to work with, we've got uh, six or eight now. Uh, already from previous workshops, and each workshop is uh, includes a YouTube session where we show how half a dozen people process that data and what they got, all the different interpretations of precisely the same data. The other thing I wanted to point out here uh, is on the, um, when you asked, when Chandrasekhar asked the question about, didn't we once have a something like this? Uh, this is basically what I did. I uh, came down to the spreadsheet and um, down, I didn't download this. I, I, you can work with it right here. And I Googled moon, or not Googled moon, but I uh, went find moon. And here's all the different, there are 14 different references to the moon here and the one that i found was whichever one i found down there okay so if uh, there it is 12th october of 2020 two young teenagers from texas decided to do some things with their and uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can if you ever have an idea that bob didn't i see that on the astro imaging channel you can go back and find it and the one thing i wanted to say was since this is our first show back from um uh, uh, after Neef and stuff, we took a little day off. There. It was wonderful seeing everybody and all the people that came up to Tim and and me while we were at there and expressed your appreciation for the Astro Imaging Show. We do appreciate that you appreciate us and that you've said something to us. We know that we're doing a lot of good work for a lot of people. Um, last night at my at uh, our club observatory site, I was sitting with somebody trying to help him figure out the uh, guiding. And he says, wow, this is really weird. It's like I've sat here for the last hour and a half with the Astro Imaging Channel, which I thought was kind of, yeah, I guess you have, but not really. I mean, I'm just I'm just another imager. And uh, by the way, we never did quite a, get it figured out. Anyway, we got a lot of really good people coming up from um, the uh, from Neef. Steve Miller's gonna be here next week. Steve, are you still on with us? Okay. Yeah, he, Steve gave a little, Okay. He gave, he gave, okay, then yeah. Russ Croman is going to tell us about artificial intelligence. Warren is going to be back. He hasn't decided what he's going to be talking about. And then Randall's going to tell us about what it was like in the beginning. And you'll and then Ron and et cetera, et cetera. And you'll notice that we're all the way pretty much full. I think we're full on January, June 18th also. I forget who it was. I haven't I haven't actually caught up with my visit from um, from Neef yet, but we're doing really good uh, up through the middle of J July. We need more people, of course, for after that. And really, anybody that's smart enough to take a lot of astro images and process them and stuff like that and knows a little bit about PowerPoint is good enough to share their imaging and their techniques with other people. So we encourage you to do that. Okay, so please be part of the Astro Imaging Channel by just um, telling us that you want to uh, volunteer and you can contact us there, contact us and we'll take it from there. Are there any more questions coming in about how they image the moon? Uh, Eric, yeah, there was one, one, one additional question uh, for Tom. How, does he, how do you determine your maximum exposure? Um, I just, oh, I, I've got a stuff yeah, here too. It, you, you want me to put oh, wait that a minute. Where am I? No, if you could just kind of give us your, your feel. Just, basically, just, just by eye. Um, you, you want it a little bit past where uh, those brightest sections start to uh, saturate out, but you don't want too much. It's there's, there's really not a hard and fast rule, and it's uh, basically practice. You just want just where your when your brightest sections are all uh, saturated. So then uh, you you have your 
your uh, the first exposure is is basically by the histogram. Uh, you make your long exposure when it's you have those small regions are saturated, and then you kind of chop chop that range up anywhere from three to five pieces. Okay. Thank you. Did we get the one about typical capture frames per second? Oh, yeah, yeah we, we did. Got it, that. it depended on the size. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Isaac and Marsha and uh, uh, Linda and Chandra Saker for participating tonight. Um, sorry I wasn't there at the very beginning, but um, we had a great time and um, hope to see you back next week so we can find out a little bit more about imaging with the DOB. So good night, everybody. I think Patrick is in charge. So Patrick, if you could go ahead and take us out. Uh, I think Terry's in charge. Terry, are you in charge? I'm sorry, Terry. Yes.